Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and I'm going to talk about robotic learning and AI. So you've probably seen some uh, impressive videos online of robots doing fantastic feats of acrobatics, and you might wonder, what is there left to do in the world of robotics? Well, if we look at what happens when these kind of robotic systems are actually put to the test in more realistic settings, we see that the results are often actually quite disappointing. So these videos are from about five years ago from the Docker Humanoid Robotics Challenge, and what this challenge basically illustrates is that when robotic systems are really put to the test in environments that are less predictable, less scripted, the results are often quite underwhelming. Why is this? Well, perhaps at the root of this problem is the fact that when we build complex systems, we're tempted to engineer them in ways that are modular and reconfigurable. For example, a standard robotic control pipeline must, might take in observations, perform some state estimation to determine where objects are located, do some modeling and predictions, some planning, and then use a controller to execute that plan. That's a very reasonable way to engineer a complex system. Unfortunately, when this kind of system is confronted with the complexity of the real world, the abstractions between the individual modules become leaky. And as we know, leaky abstractions are really a terrible thing for these kinds of systems. If the state estimator fails to properly estimate the position of some object because the object looks a little different on that particular day, then the modeling and planning and so on phases will just perform completely nonsensical things and the entire system will fail. Machine learning offers an alternative to that. Instead of designing systems in a modular way, with machine learning, our aim is really to learn the entire system end to end. So we have a robot interacts with the world, it has collected some data set from past interactions, and it's going to use that data set to train a neural network, a usually a deep, highly expressive neural network, to act as its controller. Because the learning is end to end, we're going to be directly optimizing the task objective and learning directly map from the robot's observations to its actions, which avoids many of the pitfalls associated with needing to manually specify those abstractions. We can go in and collect a little bit more data to further fine tune the system and through iterative interaction, make it better and better at the task at hand. Of course, this requires us to collect large data sets, much as state-of-the-art learning-based systems for computer vision and speech recognition require huge data sets, so do robotic learning systems. And that means that in order for this process to be scalable, it has to be automated. And in order to be automated, we have to really automate every step of this process, not just the computational process of training the model, but also the physical process of collecting that experience. Now, we might ask, has robotic learning really progressed meaningfully in the last few years? I'm going to show you a few examples from work in my lab uh, to hopefully convince you that it has. I started working on robotics about six years ago, and around 2015, we had our first result on deep learning for end-to-end -end training of manipulation skills. This was the first end-to-end -end training result for robotic manipulation policies that directly used vision, and it could perform some rudimentary tasks like putting a shape into a shape sorting cube. In 2018, about three years later, we were able to scale up robotic learning to train vision-based grasping policies on thousands of different objects. And these vision-based grasping policies now were not just doing one task, they could pretty much pick up any object using just raw RGB sensing. And this year in 2020, a system derived from this project is actually being applied to real world tasks at X, which is an alphabet company uh, that has a project developing uh, service robots. And this has been publicly announced at this point. In the domain of robotic navigation, we started working on this around 2016 when we developed some, uh, again, rudimentary deep learning methods for navigating and avoiding obstacles, initially in simulation. Around 2018, we were able to uh, develop the first prototype of such a system that could actually learn to navigate in the real world. And as of this year in 2020, we were able to scale up the system to the point where it could navigate diverse real world outdoor environments using a, a small scale ground robot, generalized to new environments it hasn't seen before, and perform all sorts of visual navigation tasks. This is work primarily uh, done by Gregory Kahn as part of his PhD thesis. In the domain of robotic locomotion, it's kind of a similar story, although although here things have been stretched out a little bit more because of safety concerns. So I actually worked on robotic locomotion back in my PhD in 2013, where we developed the first deep RL methods uh, that could be used for locomotion. This is a, an animation of a humanoid simulated robot. My student Jason Peng developed systems in 2018 that could 
control virtual humanoid robots at a level of fidelity that was indistinguishable from real human motions, doing things like uh, you know, walking on narrow ledges, traversing terrains with gaps, and so on. And as of this year, again in 2020, uh, Jason was able to scale up the system to the point where it could be used to train real-world robotic systems. So this is an actual real-world robot, a four-legged robot called a Lycago, that has learned a variety of agile locomotion and jumping behaviors, in this case by imitating motion capture of dogs. So robotic learning systems seem to be picking up. They seem to be doing something meaningful. In today's talk, what I'd like to tell you about are some of the things that have enabled some of the progress we've seen so far, some of the open problems and new directions that I anticipate to be on the horizon, and then briefly conclude with what this means for everyone else, for everyone outside of the domain of robotics. So let's start with the first topic. Of course, one of the big things that has driven progress in robotic learning is fundamental advances in reinforcement learning algorithms. An often heard refrain is that deep reinforcement learning algorithms are in some fundamental way highly inefficient or impractical for the real world. And there is evidence to support this. For example, a basic Q-learning system trained with convolutional networks to play Atari games might require 5 to 20 million frames to learn, the equivalent of weeks of real playtime. Even our own deep reinforcement learning systems from around five years ago, which used policy gradients, require on the order of the equivalent of six days if they were running in real time to train a humanoid robot to run. But this is the story from a long time ago. This is from around 2013 to 2015. And we've actually come a very long way since then. For example, we've been able to develop new and much more efficient RL algorithms. Uh, the, PhD student my, uh, the PhD thesis of my student, Thomas Harnoya, which came out in 2018, discussed an algorithm called Soft Actor Critic. This is a learning curve for Soft Actor Critic on a humanoid running task, much like the one seen on the left. The orange curve is V1 of Soft Actor Critic, the blue one is V2, and the purple one is a more modern policy gradient implementation, more modern even than the one on the left. This is the line at 500,000 steps, which is about 1.4 hours, and you can see that within 1.4 hours, these methods actually learn some reasonable behaviors. In the world of real-world vision-based robotic learning, another thing that has come a long way is not just raw efficiency, but also the ability to effectively utilize off-policy data. So the grasping result that I showed before, here these robots were trained on thousands of different objects. The goal was to really to get them to generalize uh, in a big way. And this system required 580,000 grasps to learn to grasp any object. This was collected over the course of several months. Now you might say this is a really huge amount of data to collect. But compared to something like ImageNet, where 1.5 million images are used to learn to categorize any of 1,000 classes, and the picture actually doesn't look so bad. In effect, the reinforcement learning algorithm, by appropriately leveraging off policy data, ends up with similar sample complexities for learning to grasp any object as computer vision systems require to learn to recognize any object. And the key to this is to effectively incorporate off policy data, to incorporate data gathered in previous experiments so that you could use all 580,000 to train your model. But simply developing more efficient algorithms is not all that we need to do. Let me illustrate a few of these challenges with some examples. In 2018, we did this experiment where a robot learned to open a door. We were very pleased with, our, with ourselves. But in order for it to evaluate its reward function, we need to, to install an encoder on the door hinge so it could measure how far it was open. Of course, my doors in my house don't have encoders and neither do yours. Here's another example. In 2017, we did this experiment where robots again learned to open doors. But here, the thing that you can see in this video is that when the robots open the door, someone else has come along and closed them so that the robots can try again. This is a very manual process. In 2019, my student Anusha Nagabandi uh, wanted to train a robotic hand to uh, rotate two objects in the palm, and she didn't want to do the work of resetting the robot herself manually, so she programmed a second robot to do that job for her. Uh, an effective solution, but one that again required some amount of manual engineering. If we want robots to learn the way that you and I can learn, they'll need to be able to try again on their own. So let's first talk about the problem of specifying reward functions so that we can get rid of that little encoder on the door. One way that we could imagine defining what the robot should do is to also use learning. We could provide the robot with some examples of successes and failures, and then train a classifier to classify a given state as a success or a failure. Now, this can go horribly wrong. Let me illustrate this with an example task. This is a simple simulated task. The robot here has to push the green can to the red coaster. If we simply train a classifier to recognize whether the can is on the coaster from the overhead image, 
the robot actually does something very strange. The graph in the lower right shows the prediction from the classifier. It saturates to 1.0, meaning that the classifier thinks that the robot is succeeding. But what the robot learns to do is to essentially fool the classifier every time. And this is not surprising. It's like an evil genie. It's trying to satisfy your classifier's desires in the least predictable, least expected way. We developed a method called VICE, which mitigates this problem in a very simple way. VICE simply takes all the data that the robot has collected and adds it to the training set of the classifier labeled as a negative. This might at first seem like a bad idea, but it actually ends up working very well because the positive set only contains the positives while the negative set is a mix. So true positives still get a higher probability and the robot can perform the task from this example. It's a very simple procedure. Simply add all the data the robot has collected as negatives. It enables us to learn some pretty sophisticated tasks from visually indicated examples. So here we train a reward function to reward the robot for properly draping a towel over a box. Now let's talk about that other problem, the problem of needing to try again and again. One of the ways that we can mitigate this problem is by using multitask reinforcement learning. Let me explain this with an example. Let's say that you would like to train a robot to put a cup in a coffee machine and use the coffee machine. You might say you have task one, which is put cup in coffee machine. If the robot fails and knocks over the cup, a person could come along and reset it, but we don't want to require that. We want the robot to be uh, autonomous. So we're going to introduce task two, which is to pick up the cup. If you fail on task one, try task two. If you succeed at task two, try task one again. If you fail on task two, try again. If you succeed at putting the cup in the coffee machine, maybe you can try task three, which is to replace the cup. And if you fail at that and spill the coffee, try task four, which is to clean up the spill. So by turning this into a multitask learning problem, we can essentially automate the reset process. And we've used this idea to good effect in a number of past projects. This is some earlier work we did about five years ago. Here, our task graph looks like this. The robot has to reach to the, towards the table and then pick up the object. As long as it doesn't pick up the object, it can try again. But once it picks it up, it can use that as an opportunity to learn to place the object in different places on the table and then learn to pick them up from there. This allows the robot to learn the entire family of picking up and placing tasks without any human intervention. Here's a more recent experiment we did that used this idea to learn how to walk. Here, this robot needs to learn to walk forward and backward without any human intervention. It has two tasks, walking forward and backward. If it falls down, it'll activate a stand-up controller to stand back up. And if it gets to the edge of the arena, then we'll turn around and practice the opposite task. And this allows it to learn how to walk, again, without any human intervention. If we don't want to manually specify all the tasks, we could actually learn them automatically. So here, in this experiment, a human first defines the task, which is to put two beads on the abacus on the left and two on the right, using the vice method from the previous slide. And then the robot is going to have two tasks. The first one is the real task, which is to move the beads on the abacus. And the second is a perturbation task that forces the policy to succeed from multiple starting states. The way the perturbation task works is like this. The robot attempts the task, and then the perturbation controller attempts to move to a state that is different from all the states seen before, to force the forward policy to attempt to succeed from a new state. The forward policy and the perturbation controller are learned jointly, and after about 24 hours of training, the robot can reliably move the beads on the abacus so the two are on the left and two are on the right. Okay, let me briefly talk about some open problems and new directions in this area. One of the really exciting things about robotic learning is that when it is truly autonomous, there's no need to separate a training phase from a test phase. This means that robots can learn and fine tune on the job. Here's an example of this in a recent paper that we had. Let's say that you train this grasping policy. It gets to a 96% success rate, but requires about 600,000 trials. And then the robot is placed in a new situation where it has to pick up these glass bottles. And perhaps these glass bottles are different from what it's seen before and it fails. It gets a 49% success rate. Well, with reinforcement learning, there's no need for human labels, so the robot can simply keep training. And after about 800 trials or about four hours, it can actually master this glass bottles task. It can adapt to the transparent bottles, to different colors backing, to changes in the gripper morphology, even an offset of 10 centimeters to the gripper. This kind of lifelong learning capability is tremendously powerful, and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of it in robotic learning. Another really powerful idea that's on the horizon is unsupervised embodied learning. Imagine that your robot can generate its own goal, attempt to reach that goal, and then use the resulting data to update both the goal generator and the policy. 
Now you could have a robot learn a variety of behaviors without any human task specification at all. Here's a video of some of our initial experiments with this idea. We placed a robot in front of a door and we didn't give it any particular instructions. We just told it to execute this basic recipe and set goals for itself that were unusual, that were different from what it's seen before. Very quickly, it noticed that when it opened the door, it saw some pretty unusual states. So after the first five hours or so, it starts playing with the door and learning to manipulate it. After 25 hours of training, we can set new goals for the robot by providing it goal images, and we can test it on being able to open the door to all different angles, and it succeeds pretty reliably at this. There are many more topics in future work that I don't have time to go into in detail. These include things like reinforcement learning algorithms that learn how to learn, which is something we've done a bit of work on, fully offline reinforcement learning algorithms that can utilize exclusively log data, so just like this recipe from before, only without collecting more experience. This can be really important in safety critical domains like autonomous driving or other domains like medical diagnosis. And we've done quite a bit of work on this topic as well. And of course, hierarchical reinforcement learning where temporally extended tasks can be mastered by learning systems that set their own goals and then use lower level policies to reach those goals. But to conclude, let me talk a little bit about what implications this kind of robotic learning technology has for everybody else. Robotic learning is essentially a, uh, a kind of uh, special case of a generalized autonomous decision-making problem. And when we work on robotic learning, we're really making progress on autonomous decision-making. So if you have a, an agent that collects a data set, use that data set to train a model and collect some more data, the data could include a robot navigating its environment, a robot manipulating objects, but it could also consist of other things like uh, a medical diagnosis system prescribing a course of treatment or the operation of a chemical plant. The learn model would, could then be a more effective driving controller, a better robotic manipulation policy, or maybe a better policy for controlling a chemical plant or a policy for setting a, a patient treatment plan. The basic underlying mathematics and the basic technology is going to be the same. Similarly, the step where we collect more data can be treated as a kind of computational design for what experiment we can do to best refine our model. And we could use this kind of process for problems like model-based optimization, where we're designing new drugs uh, by iteratively collecting data and evaluating the uh, expected efficacy of new designs. So to summarize, I talked about how robotic learning has really come a long way, how fundamental advances in algorithms, as well as supporting technologies like setting rewards and resetting the environment have enabled a lot of this progress how there are many open problems and new directions on the horizon, and how success in this area can lead to very interesting applications across a range of domains beyond just robotics. I'd like to especially thank my students uh, who were involved in this work, and thank you very much for listening.